Hey, Blue Collar Millionaires, back again. We've got Mike Seidel here today. He's going to talk about his journey from owning a business to selling it to now investing in deals and all kinds of other stuff. Chris is a little under the weather today. He's on. He's a trooper. But me and Mike will be doing most of the talking. Mike, thanks for coming on. Tell us a little about your story. Oh, sure. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, well, started my first company back in 87. I was on the front end of uh, medical alert systems, push a button, get an ambulance. Did that for about 10 years with a partner. Uh, we had several thousand customers in 15 states, sold it to a public company. Took five years off after that, 16 months of it, drove around the U.S. in a motorhome. Uh, drove up to uh, Alaska, so we went through Canada. And uh, between the motorhome and the car, in those 16 months, we did 56,000 miles, believe it or not. Yeah. And then uh, took a little more time off when I was done with that. So a total of five years, moved to Idaho, started a uh, restoration company, you know, property damage and so on and so forth, just like what Chris does. And uh, built it up after 13 years. We were doing approximately 30 jobs a month at a whole contents processing facility and uh, everything that goes along with that. And so that, that in Idaho? I was doing that in Boise, Idaho. Yep. How, how long between selling the company and starting the restoration company five years between five years the, yeah what what made you go back well i sold my first company at 33 and all the other kids are still in school so you mm -hmm. have nobody to play with um and i just wanted to keep growing and trying different things and the funny thing is when i started the restoration company and everybody laughs at this i was an economics major my dad left when i was five so I know nothing about fixing cars. I know nothing about construction. And when I started the company, I didn't know the difference between a flathead and a Phillips head screwdriver. Wow. And I didn't care. I, I was strong on the mitigation side, the structural drying. And I hired project managers that did the construction side. And after 13 years, I learned it. So now I can put a house together. I can tell you how to put, put a house together, but you want me nowhere near power tools. What that's crazy. What what drew you to um, the restoration? You saw an opportunity. Yeah, I saw an opportunity, and I was an economics major in college, and I was always focused on um, recession resistant businesses. So if you have a fire in your house, you're going to get it fixed regardless of what the economy is. If your house is flooded, you're going to get it fixed. So it was a way to uh, uh, be recession resistant, and you know it's it's a needed service. So how did you do during the recession in 2008? That's funny you say that. Uh, we grew from yeah. January 1st of 2010 to December 31st of 2011. We doubled sales. Wow. Because a lot of people were going out of business uh, and a lot of people were afraid to start businesses. So there wasn't as much competition. And yeah. like I said, if there's damage, you're getting it done. Absolutely. So. So what are you doing? You're in Florida now? No, actually, I live in Texas now. And when I sold my restoration company, we moved uh, moved to Phoenix first. And then ultimately, in 2019, we came to Texas. Uh, I live in uh, Fort Worth. And I started doing private lending back in 2019. So now I'm lending full time to people who fix and flip single family. And then I've also done some lending to some multifamily guys for their EMD or bridge loans. <clears throat> Excellent. How are you seeing the real estate market changing, everything changing now as far as the lending and how does that affect you? Well, what I'm seeing is some of the larger guys in the market who are getting money from Wall Street. So they're getting what's not, they're doing what's called correspondent lending or they have warehouse lines with banks. Uh, those are um, closing up on them. So they're kind of being left, hold, uh, being left holding the bag. Uh, for me, I use all private capital. I use my own capital as well as that of several investors. So what we're seeing is uh, an uptick in people who are looking for loans uh, because we have the capital available. Uh, and what I'm finding on the sell side is that my guys are taking longer to sell the properties, whereas they were selling them six months ago in a couple of days. Now it's 30, yeah. 60, 90, 120 days. So, and I had one guy who I had, a little over a million dollars out with and he stopped flipping completely and now he's just doing dispo wow yeah a lot of changes hey, mike i want to go back to your first business how you started it to 
the exit. A lot of people in this group, um, they're looking to buy business, but a lot, most of the people have started businesses. And of course, we're all looking to exit and most people never exit their business. So what was the idea? What was like from everything? How did you start that? And then how did you end up selling that? Okay. Well, there was absolutely no plan to start it. Um, a, my business partner got a postcard in the mail for a company out of New Jersey called uh, Life Call that was selling franchises. So we went to their facility. We learned how to uh, uh, market the product, how it worked. And we just went out and <clears throat> started going to, <clears throat> excuse me, what are called councils on aging or areas, <clears throat> area agencies on aging. And they have contacts with people who are elderly and live in their homes. Uh, so we just started beating, knocking doors, handing out brochures, and it was just a hell of a lot of work. Uh, when I first started the business, I don't sleep well. So I would be at the office at five o'clock in the morning and not leave until 10 o'clock at night. And this was seven days a week. I was 23. So it was much easier to do it back then. Now I'm 58 and I have no desire to do that. Um, so put in a lot of hours and you just keep grinding, you keep going. As far as the sale process, we got to the point where we were comfortable, we were doing well. We were approached by several people to purchase the company. And then um, we were approached by a public company. They were an alarm company uh, and they were interested in going into medical alerts at the time they were doing security alarms. And they came to look at our operation and they made us an offer, which was more than we thought it was worth. And uh, we said, yeah. And it's, there's a funny story around that. When they came to our conference, they sat in a conference room and they were negotiating with us and they came up, you know, they offered their number. And uh, my partner and I said, well, that's not exactly the number that we were thinking about, but uh, let us step out and talk about it. And uh, <laughs> we actually hugged because it was so much more than we thought it was going to be. <laughs> so we hugged. It was like, holy shit, can you believe that? And yeah. he was a negotiator and he said, yeah, yeah, but that's not their final offer. But I'm like, Fuck yeah, but hell, this is okay. So we ended up negotiating over another 30 days, and then uh, then we sold uh, another. Th actually, it ended up taking a year to sell once we agreed to the number, uh, because they were a public company. They had to issue some stock in order to do the purchase, and it was a little bit involved. Um, Mike, so can you disclose? Uh I mean, you don't have to give us what your net or what your uh, gross revenue was, but what was the multiple that they offered you on that business? Well, you remember? we had what has now come a uh, popular phrase is monthly recurring revenue. Because we had several thousand customers, what we got was 17 times our average monthly revenue for the last year is what we sold for. Wow. Oh, no, it was a cash business. It, I mean, it's a very profitable, not cash, a very profitable business. So you had a great bit, great business model, that reoccurring monthly model. Oh man, MRR is is sweet. Wow, yeah, seventeen you could, times on that. No wonder you had so much time. You see, well, what's that feel like at thirty three and you're basic, you're done, you're kind of almost, you're done if you want to be. Um, it was a little overwhelming and a little bit uh, very moving. Uh, once I. Uh, once the money hit my account, I actually cried wow. because I come from an area in Massachusetts where heroin was a problem 50 years ago. Um, the boat used to bring it in. I grew up in Fall River, Mass, um, and the boats out of New Bedford used to bring it in from Florida. So I can name 15 people that I grew up with that are dead in jail or have been in jail. So to get to that. And as I said earlier, I think, yeah, I said earlier, my dad left when I was five. So I grew up hungry at times. Uh, there were times we didn't have food. So for me to get to that level, oh yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty moving. Um, but I'm still the guy that will go to, uh, you know, Texas Roadhouse instead of Ruth Chris. Mike, not to shift gears, but I didn't know that about Fall River. Um, Cause I read, read Chris Heron's book. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I, I did not know that that was uh, just unique to that area, that it was so much more. Because yeah, that was a crazy story I read about when I read his book. Yeah, I know Chris uh, in passing. He's a few years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, his dad was an attorney. And there was a there was a piece in the book 
where if you listen to uh, Bill Reynolds from the uh, Boston Herald or Boston Globe, and what he talked about Fall River and Chris's story is people who leave Fall River don't ever actually leave Fall River. And they end up coming back. And, you know, as you read the story, Chris made it all the way to the Celtics. And yeah. where I'm from, that makes you a god. If you right. can make it to the Celtics, the Pats, et cetera. And uh, he would have a game, you know, late afternoon, early evening. And he'd be down in Fall River shooting up before he went to the game. And he's playing in the NBA. I'm crazy. Oh, yeah. So I could tell stories. <laughs> wow. So to answer your question, it was extremely moving and uh, it felt good. So all that off just a flyer and idea, and then you just made, took action and went to New Jersey. Yeah, that's all it is. Um, I mean, and it's funny because I know people, I was a C student in school uh, and I know people even in my circle that are much smarter than I am and they're just not taking action. And I sometimes fall into that where I overanalyze but I'm able to pull myself out after a period of time. And I'll just say, you know, you got to get moving. You just got to move. And it's, they overanalyze and they're looking at every angle. And it's kind of like with my investors, I've learned that I don't want to take money from an engineer because their attention to detail is too great. And they're calling you all the time. Uh, with my investors now, I simply send them a text and I say, um, you know, a new loan tomorrow, 180 grand by noon and suddenly 180 grand shows up in my checking account. I'll get a text and say it's on the way and I don't hear from them. I just send them their payments every month. And when the principal pays off, I pay them off. How did you, how did you cultivate those relationships? Cause I know that that wasn't just uh, you know, a social media post. And then all of a sudden you had these people willing to wire you money like that. <laughs> well, my first investor, was somebody that I knew who was a fellow business owner who I'd known for several years back in uh, Idaho. And he and I were looking at a uh, medical marijuana grow in Oklahoma. I told him about it. We both, he flew in, I drove up from where I live and we were out to dinner and he asked me how the lending business was going. And I told him and he said, well, are you ever gonna put my money on the street? I was like, what do you mean am I gonna put your money on the street? He said, well, I've got some money I'd like to put out and two years ago, I told you about it. You said you wanted to get your operations up together and I never heard from you. So I thought you didn't want my money. I said, no, I'll take it. So from that, I put his money on the street pretty quick. Uh, he has since given me more uh, since that point. And then I just started telling other people within my circle who are business owners and I know are retired and have some capital. And I told them what I was doing and they like it because of my background. I owned a, uh, you know, the restoration company. And I also have a unique skill set in that before I started my business at 23, when I first got out of college, um, I worked at a facility for sexual abused kids for two years. And I ran a group home for mentally retarded men. And I wrote, I uh, worked as a mental health worker. So my ability to read people is a little bit more advanced than most people. It's a little more than elementary. So because I was putting out, I have several million of my own on the street. So I had a system that was proven with my money because they're investing in, with the same people that I'm investing with. And I have the construction background. So if somebody doesn't finish a house, I can finish it. I can finish that easily. Uh, and because of all this, when I tell somebody what I do, they, it, it's a very simple thing. When you just got to talk to everybody and you got to get in the right rooms. I'm not, I'm not in the rooms, you know, I'm not at McDonald's telling this to people. I will go to events like with like Mark Evans and I, I see the places that I go, like Lois and I were on vacation. We were on vacation in Africa back in September for three weeks. Well, I sat down with somebody who was there and she was a high net worth individual. We started talking and she said, well, how about if I give you 250 and we'll see how it works. If it works better, then we can get up. If it works well, then we get up to seven figures. So now I have 250 of hers out on a loan, actually about 230. So it's just getting in the right rooms and talking to people and letting them know. What kind of rates are they looking for your investors when, when they're deploying with you? Well, if you're okay with sharing that. No, that's okay. I don't mind sharing it. What it is, is most of them are unhappy with what's going, they want, 
they're unhappy with what's going on in Wall Street and they're unhappy with what returns they can get in the bank. So they're happy. I've had people come forward and say they'll take 4%. Um, I pay more than that. They generally get paid between 8 and 10%, depending on who it is that I'm lending to and what the risk is that I assess. So I, I want to pull you back for a second. I know, Kevin, I told you I, I was just going to sit back and chill, but these interviews get me excited. Feel a little better I'm now. <laughs> I like your the, story, Mike. The, uh, the, the restoration company, you yep. said you started that up. That was a startup. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So talk to us about that, because I know there's a lot of the viewers in this group that are startups and there's a ton of trials and tribulations that happen in startups. What's some of the things that helped you be successful in that restoration business? Because coming from the same background, it is a huge operational uh, undertaking. Yep. Well, I think some of the things that helped are that I, by nature, am a very systematic individual. I see things in, I like to see things in an organized format. Disorder annoys the heck out of me. Now, do I make sure that stuff on my plate isn't touching? No, I'm not OCD. But I look at places like McDonald's uh, and you can buy a hamburger in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and it tastes the same in um, Key West, Florida. I know because I've done it and I watch their operations and how they operate. So what has helped me is to understand that everything needs to have a system and process. And if it doesn't have a system and process, you're going to waste time. And it's all about time. When you're wasting time, you're wasting money. Another thing that has helped me is because I was a C student, I know that there are a lot of people that are smarter than me. And when you're in the restoration industry, it's very male dominated and guys like to have the upper hand. So I had no problem walking up to somebody and say, listen, dude, you know much more about this than me. You're the expert. Can you teach me? And as soon as you do that and you're not sticking out your chest and you're not trying to uh, not you're not afraid to admit that they know more than you, they will jump right in. As soon as you say the word help teach, they their their barrier goes down. So it's a matter of being OK with being uncomfortable and acknowledging that you have no idea what you're doing. Um, when I was going to buy the franchise, I let the, fran uh, I bought, let the franchisor know that I knew nothing about construction. They gave me a book. So then what I did was I went to construction sites and I would speak to a framer. I'd go and speak with an electrician. I'd go and speak with a plumber because I figured these guys know. And interestingly enough, a couple of those, those guys became my subs. And if I had a question, They'd answer it because I was up front with them and didn't know, let them. Uh, sorry, I didn't. I let them know I didn't know what I was doing, and they were fine. So I guess it's kind of a long answer. But what has served me well is understanding systems and processes are extremely important, and acknowledging when somebody has more knowledge than me and learning from them. The way I look at it is, this person may think I'm totally incompetent, but as soon as I walk out of the room, everybody else is going to think I'm an expert. So it'll be my little secret with him. <laughs> yeah, I, I think your level of confidence to show that humility is. I think it's great. Huge. And the, and the truth is, because I did the same thing. Uh, I used to, um, I've never laid a shingle, but I've done big roofing jobs, entire apart, apartment complexes. And I used to bring on roofers and, and take them out and get them a beer. And I would just be really humble and say, like, tell me, tell me how this works and that works. And they don't. They, it is your little secret with them, but they don't, they, they're usually really nice and they want to help you. If you Absolutely. come from that thing, like you're an expert, tell me. And I would just have guys tell me for hours. Next thing I knew, I knew, I knew like every piece of it, how to order, how to do everything. It's really valuable stuff to do. And people don't know that, that you got that information like that. Oh, sure. I mean, I, I'll never forget going to the building department. The first time I went to get a building permit. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but I had to pull a building permit. So the guy who was in charge, I went in and I said, listen, Perry, I have never pulled a building permit. I have no idea what I'm doing. Here's the paperwork I filled out. Can you help me? He was my, he was my friend from that point forward. He would actually let us start construction on stuff before he issued the permit because we were in a hurry. So I just get on the phone with him and say, hey, Perry, I've got one. I got to start right away. So yeah, go ahead. I'll issue the permit in a week or so. I'll let the guys know. 
So yeah, you build a relationship with them and yeah, you acknowledge that you have no idea what you do with it and they're okay with it. So yeah, just be honest with people. What did your, what did your company look like when you, uh, when you ended up actually selling it, the, the employees, the size, the gross revenue, that kind of deal? Oh, gee. Well, what I can tell you is um, the company that I sold it to, I, saw, I signed a confidentiality agreement, so I can't tell you the exact numbers. But what I can tell you is a multi-million dollar operation. We had um, about 14,000, 14, five square feet. We had um, 15 in-house employees. We had probably 20 or 25 subcontractors that we used, number of suppliers, et cetera. I had um, three full-time mitigation trucks on the street. We had two reconstruction trucks. Uh, altogether, we had 15 vehicles when I sold. Uh, yeah, I think it was 15. And then in our facility, we had a full contents processing. So we could clean, and Chris, you'll know about this. We would use, um, excuse me, deionized water. So we would clean electronics. Uh, and what I always used to get a kick out of was when you bring insurance agents in and you explain to them that water does not actually conduct electricity, it always blows their mind. And then what you do is you take the deionized water, you put an electrical cord into it and it shows no charge in the water because you've removed the iron. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry. That was a little digression there, but yeah, we had about a 15, 14,000, 14, five square foot processing facility and another 5,000 square feet of uh, storage. What did your team look like when you sold that and how many of them stayed on for the new company? Uh, they all stayed on for the new company. Okay. Um, some of them have since actually most of them have since left because they were used to my way of doing things. Um, the right. company that bought me was on the eastern side of Idaho. I was on the western side and they had a different way of doing things than I did. And I was a little more systemized and my people were taught to do things in a certain way. Um, you know, our air movers were on were in the exact same spot on all three trucks. Screwdrivers were in the exact same spot. And they like my systems and operations. So a number of them have left and they left within the first 12 months. How did you, how did you find, was there a broker involved in selling that business? Uh, nope, not at all. I was in an industry event and I started speaking with a, somebody on the Eastern side of the state. And we just had a general conversation about selling, how we were feeling, et cetera. And then uh, once I decided to sell, I gave them first shot at it and they bought it. But it was a relationship that I already had. I didn't use a broker. I didn't use a broker for either business that I sold. Wow. Why, why a franchise? So both, both the businesses you bought were franchises? Is that because you like systems kind of things set up before? Well, there was no thought process in the first one. We bought a franchise and that franchisor went out of business. And we were actually their largest account. So what we did was we simply uh, found a manufacturer of the equipment. We found a central monitoring station. We trademarked our own name and um, we just went off on our own. The systems that they offered were very minimal. The whole franchise was only five grand. Um, they just wanted us to use their monitoring station is what it came down to. Uh, so there weren't many systems with them. With the second business, I knew I needed somebody who knew the industry because, like I said, I knew nothing about construction and I knew nothing about structural drying in the mitigation side. So I wanted somebody that could lead me along that path and uh, give me some some structure and background. OK, Mo moving forward now and at 58, what do you out, outside of lending or anything? Would you what are you looking to do? Would you start another business? Would you invest in other businesses? What are you looking to do? Well, um, what I'm looking to do is automate the existing business a little more. Um, I took five vacations this year and I maxed out on my capacity with myself and my VAs. So what I'm doing is I'm automating it now that I know where the holes are and tightening things up. Um, on a personal level, I want to continue to travel. I've already been to 32 countries. I've been to 50 states. I've been to three, three four continents. And my goal and my better half Lois's goal is to go to a hundred countries and seven continents. So I want to continue the lending business because I can do it with a backpack. Uh, I'm sorry, with my computer, a backpack, a couple of travel screens that I like to use and uh, my VAs. 
As far as investing in other things, I've looked at a number of different things. Uh, I looked at the medical marijuana grow. Uh, I'm speaking with some people about self-storage now. And uh, I've spoken with a couple people about multifamily. So I'm looking at different opportunities. But for me, I have a specific criteria. Uh, because I understand what can happen in the economy, I'm interested in experienced operators who went through the crash. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, it's been a rising tide since 2010. Um, and the analogy that I like to use is if I'm on a boat that's going to sail around the world, I don't want somebody who was in the Caribbean uh, in June and July. I want one of those guys from the deadliest catch as the captain of my boat. Because <laughs> those guys got a big set and, you know, they're out there smoking and yeah, I'm grabbing and you got 30, 40 foot seas. So when I invest, that's who I'm looking for to invest with. Someone who's had their teeth kicked in. And it's still I, I, I agree. I, I like the same thing. So, so many, so many things have gone right over the last 10 years. I don't know if they're uh, battle tested. Oh yeah. You had these people that were investing in uh, what the heck was it? GameStop and AMC. And they thought they were investors. You're not an investor. You're gambling. You got lucky. You got lucky, exactly. Yeah, a little bit, and now they're getting their butts kicked. So, so, so I heard you mention VAs. I, I'm big on VAs. I have a lot of VAs. It's really helped my business. Um, where do you, where do you find them? How do you hire them? If you give a little background on that, people always ask me about that as well. Oh sure. Um, I found out about VAs back in 2018. I didn't even know it was a thing, and I learned from somebody that what I'll do is uh, I'll go to Upwork for yeah. employees. I'll go to Fiverr for gigs. So I have a lead magnet that I'm developing right now. And I got a copywriter for a couple hundred bucks to write everything up for me. And I'm going back and forth with her. And it was very simple um, to find them. What I do is like when I'm going to hire somebody, I look for somebody off of Upwork who has had 10,000 hours of work and has a rating. Uh, I aim for 95 or better but I will go as low as 90. And that way I know that they've kept people happy over a period of time. If they only have a few reviews, then it just skews their numbers too much because they could have had disagreement with the person that hired them or they could be incompetent. I don't know when it's only a few, but if I see a history of happy people, then Absolutely. that's what I focus on. And then what I try to do, huh, I've done a number of times is find people who are working in the industry who are not looking for work, find out what they're making and offer them a little bit more than what they're making now or a little bit more freedom with their schedule. Find out what the pain point is for them and I'll take them away from somebody who's in the industry. That's good. I do the same thing on looking at the ratings. I use Upwork, almost yep. the same criteria. The big thing for me is I read the comments and I want to see what people wrote because yep. a lot of people will give High, a high ranking just to kind of like get rid of it yep. and they'll have no comments. And if you, I know the people who've worked for me and I'll write three, four paragraphs on them when they did a good job. And otherwise I might just like five stars, like, yeah, just help them out. But I don't really feel that strongly about them. Absolutely. And what I try and do, and I believe I do is to treat them as if they're in my office with me and I treat them as employees. So my people happen to be in the Philippines so I have a list of Filipino holidays and I pay them for those days and they don't have to work on those days. Excellent. Um, I know when their birthdays are. Um, I will see videos on uh, personal development. I'm big into that myself. And if I see something that's particularly moving, I'll send a link to them and they can watch it while I'm paying them so that they understand that I'm focused on their development as well. Um, I give them uh, Christmas bonuses. We speak on at least a weekly basis, sometimes a couple times a week. And then Lois and I want to go to China. And the two VAs that I've had with me for several years, I've because they're from the Philippines, it's a quick flight over. I've told them that when Lois and I go to China, I'll pay for their airfare. I'll pay for a week in a hotel. They can hang out with us for one day, but the rest of it is on me. That's so, awesome. Yeah, I treat them as employees, but then I also give them systems. For example, um, I have I video recorded each of the things I want them to do, and I show it to them step by step. So when they have a question about something, they don't have to come to me. They can just look at the recording. 
and I, te I do it once, and then I don't have to keep doing it. Mike, we do so many of the same things. Um, all mine are in Philippines, the same type of things. And I do the same thing. I do uh, a document where I write it up really uh, well. And then I do a screen record of me doing that task. And I've had great, uh, great success with them. But I like it because if something happens to a VA or I don't or it doesn't work out, I have this manual ready to go. I love your analogy with McDonald's because that's how I try to run everything. It's friend. McDonald's oh, yeah. has the best systems. They literally have high school kids running McDonald's. You should have, it's funny, uh, higher skill set of employee, but you should have seen me at the uh, Camry factory in Louisville, Kentucky. I just fell in love with that place. You could practically eat off the floor and the way their systems and operations work where they have the chairs or the seat on a pneumatic arm and you come into the Camry, you do what you need to do and you push out. You never have to stand up. The employees only work on a specific task four hours a day, and then they switch to a different task in the afternoon so that they don't get the carpal tunnel. And I got so geeked out on that place. I was speaking to one of the engineers. I spoke with him for about 45 minutes. We were talking about different systems and operations. Dude, I'm telling you, I was so satisfied I needed a cigarette when I was done with that place. <laughs> but yeah. It, VAs, just treat them as employees, give them firm direction on what you want them to do. And uh, yeah, I've been very happy. And you're not always going to uh, uh, shoot 100%. I've had a couple. And what I do is I give them simple tasks, and then I build upon them. Because if they can't do the simple, they can't do the complex. Yeah. And I just build upon it. And I have a couple right now. And the young lady who's now full time with me, she's a freaking rock star. I just give her a little bit of direction and she took off. Like I need a new checking account. Uh, I'm not happy with my bank, with the way that they're doing stuff. So I gave her a list of what it was that I was looking for yesterday. And she's already sent me three different options for banks. She spent like five hours on it. And I told her very specifically what I was looking for. Yeah. And, and it works the same as um, like an American employee. If they're good, you would ask them if they know anyone else because they're more likely to bring somebody and then they have ownership and they train them. So my main v VA in, in the Philippines, um, she has trained many people and she constantly is bringing people. She, she used to work in the hotel industry. She's been with me since 2016, but we know because of COVID, so many people lost their jobs out there. So yeah. she always says, hey, I want to hire this person. I watched that they worked with me for three years. They're smart. I know how they work. I say, let's do it. And she, she'll, she'll train them. That is 100% accurate. And it's interesting because I learned that in the restoration industry. If you have someone who is a good drywaller, he knows good painters. Absolutely. He doesn't hang out with bad painters. If you have a good uh, finished carpenter, and finished carpentry is really a skill, is actually an art to it when you see the multi-million dollar homes. If I ask a finished carpenter who a good drywaller is, he can name good drywallers yep. and they don't hang out or refer bad ones. I mean, think about it. He um, knows the bad ones too. Yeah. Oh yeah. He knows who to stay away from. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. You, Pete, water seeks its own level and high, high flyers want to hang out with high flyers. High level Absolutely. people hang out with high level people. That's Absolutely. the best. That's the best way to build companies. Uh, I guess any company, but blue collar companies, people always say, oh, you can't find anyone. You, you, that's a great way. Ask good employees you have, who else they know. And then you got to make a, a package and you got to make it an attractive place to, to work. You got to pay people right. And you got to make it somewhere people want to work and see a vision and see a future. 100%. You need employee buy-in. And what's interesting is in none of my companies was I the highest paying employer. I think it has to do with, now, I didn't shoot 100%. I have some former employees that would probably never work for me again, and I get that. Mm -hmm. um, because growing up the way that I did, I can be a little prickly at times, and I acknowledge that. So um, what was I going to say? I'm sorry, I lost, I lost my train of thought. Just, just hiring employees and, and, and yeah, looking back that's on it. I'm sorry. So yeah, thank you. you. You give them the vision, and you let them do the buy-in, but you let them uh, uh, design things. For example, I had an idea when I designed my vehicles in Idaho, all three of them, the way I wanted them to go. I had an idea of where I wanted it to go, but
but I didn't work in those trucks every day. So I only did it from, uh, for, to a certain degree, an outsider's perspective. So I had them tell me how they thought we should set up the truck and we would stress test it. And I'd say, well, but if the dehumidifier goes there, it's going to block this piece of equipment here. Okay. Okay. And then they'd redesign. It probably took them 60, 80 hours to design the first truck. And then the others went together in a couple hours. Yep. So it was a let, let them buy in and understand that stuff's going to happen to them. Um, they're going to have times where they don't have enough money and they can't buy gas. So you go pick them up and bring them to work because we all have hiccups. I remember one guy, his car broke down and they had sold his wife's car and it was going to take a couple of weeks to do whatever it was to the car. Well, I let him take one of the company trucks for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And he used that back and forth on a personal level so that he didn't have to, you know, rent a car uh, because it's, he wasn't going to have coverage for it. So it's just a matter of, yeah, you can find employees. It's a matter of how you treat them, whether they're going to stay or not. You, that's the thing, interesting what you're just saying about parking. You, you just have to ask them what makes I'll, I used to ask them what will make this a better experience for you? What do you not like? What do you like? People don't want to answer that because they have or ask that because they have an ego and they think they're going to say all these things. But I remember I had one main employee and he said, you know, I don't like driving 35 minutes in traffic to go get the van in the morning. Um, yep. I know a place that's like seven minutes from my home. I can park it there. I let him do it. It cost me like forty dollars more a month. But like he was happy. It was a no brainer. And, and we probably saved the money on the gas, too. Absolutely. My my right hand person in my restoration business, um, I want it because to me, certain things are a commodity. A pen's a pen. I don't care where you buy it. I want the cheapest damn pen. But I had a conversation with her and she said, listen, I don't like buying from Staples or Office Depot. I don't get the service and I waste time. Can we buy from, and I forget the local company. I know the manager there and he'll take my call if I have a problem and he'll take care of us. I know it's gonna be more expensive, but it'll make my life easier. Yeah, go ahead. Buy from wherever you want. I don't care. So I was willing to pay that extra money to make her happy and make things flow a little more smoothly. So I gave my people the opportunity to do that with my um, with my project managers. And I had three of them. I let them pick the subcontractors that they were going to use. It was totally up to them to cultivate subcontractors and bring them in. And I know the one of the flooring guys I didn't get along with at all. And that was okay. My guys like them. So you work with them. And I'll be polite when I see him. I'll just avoid him because he and I don't vibe. But, but my employees like them. So let them work with them. So, yeah, let them buy in. Let them have some control and ownership because the advantage to that is if it goes wrong, they own it. So Mike, they're more willing to step up. Mike, so much great stuff today. And I really appreciate it. If you could give me, just to put you on the spot a little bit, like what are like three things maybe you would have done differently? I like to ask people, I like to think that for myself, what would you have done differently, even though you had major success at an early age for guys coming up who maybe businesses are only grossing three or $400,000? What are like a, a two or three things that are like key things that can get you over the hump? Huh? Well, one of the things was you need to realize that it is sometimes better to shut things down and re-energize and rejuvenate yourself and then go back to work. I worked too many hours in the beginning and at a sawmill, they will shut the saws down so that they can sharpen the blades. Ultimately, the blade is not going to work. It doesn't matter how many hours you have it going. So uh, if it's worn down. So I would take a little more time off and recharge because then you ultimately actually do better because you re-energize. And if you look at uh, Olympic athletes, they will tell you that every day of the week. The same as a body needs recovery, the mind needs recovery. So that would be one of the things I would do is uh, be more focused on that and keep my health in, uh, in check. Um, I would have gotten books earlier on how to manage people. Um, I was 23. I haven't worked for anybody since I was 23 when I started my first company. So my management skills, I would have read um, more books and gotten better at management because I'm 23. I'm hiring people that are in their 40s and 50s. Yeah. And they're looking at me as their son or their grandson. So I would have, uh, I would have done that. Um, Is there a book in particular you really liked on management? 
Oh, wow. Um, it's, it's years back. Um, actually, one that I read probably about 10 years ago was, um, what's it, uh, Think It, not, no, not Think It Grow Rich, um, Well Done. I think it was Stephen Covey wrote it. It's a parable about how they teach the whales down in SeaWorld and how they teach them with uh, positive reinforcement versus negative. Uh, so when they do something wrong, they don't scold them. When they do something right, they reward them. And I found that to be uh, a very good book for me. A very effective. Um, way. So what is the third thing I would do starting out? Um, I probably would have jumped in and grown even faster because, as I said, I can get bogged down sometimes in analyzing. I find it's better if I just jump in and go and figure it out as I go along because you can prepare and get analysis paralysis and freeze up. You just got to go and figure it out. And I found out a couple of years ago that Silicon Valley does that all the time. They send, they send out computer products and they have a, a saying, it's called MVP, minimally viable product. They put out the basic thing that they can put out, let the market tell them what it's missing. And then on 2.0, it's a better product. So just go out and do it. I think that's a great one. And remember Microsoft Windows in the early 90s? They, these guys are probably not old enough, but uh, to, they had so many bugs and they were just wow. making it better all the time. I mean, yeah. they were just, and they were making hundreds of millions of dollars. Absolutely. Just because do it. Just do it. Yep. Yeah. Just do it. Just jump right in. And I mean, hell. That's that's the model for Silicon Valley. And look how much those guys are worth. Put it out there and figure it out. But just keep going and know that you're never going to have a perfect product. It's not going to happen. There are, there's Because if you make a tweak, it's going to cause a ripple effect. And other things are now going to get broken because of that tweak. Just keep going and acknowledge that you made a mistake. Let's move on. Fix it and go. Wow, Mike, that was great stuff. How can people follow you, reach out to you? Um, maybe you could put that in the comments after when we post this. Sure. What's the yeah, I mean, you're going to laugh at this. Because I was putting out my own money and I've just started putting other people's money out, my whole lending model is based on knowing my borrowers very well. So most of them I've known for several years. So I don't have a website. I'm just developing one now. Wow. So yeah, you can laugh at that. That's okay. Everybody does. Um, but they can, my email is Mike at Cedar Oak, REI.com. Uh, Cedar Oak are, you know, the two trees. Uh, and I can put that in the comments and then uh, just find me on Facebook under Mike Seidel and we can connect. All right, Mike, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. you gave a lot of gold nuggets today. Awesome. Appreciate I appreciate you, Mike. All right, Chris. See you later. Thanks, guys. Right. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. Yep.